My name is Paul Shelley, and welcome to The Astro Historian. This is a channel dedicated to exploring and explaining the lore of sci-fi and space universes and discussing their impact. Today we'll be talking about the peak example of the new UAE Navy, the powerful Hammerhead Patrol gunship. Before we get into that, I want to thank you all for your continued support. We are quickly rising in sub count, nearing the forbidden number of Star Citizen. And that has everything to do with you right now. That being said, still, not even half of you are subscribed to the channel. So if you've been enjoying the videos, be sure to hit the like button, and if you haven't already done so, subscribe, and be sure to hit the bell icon to stay up to date on the latest videos. If you want to go that extra mile, we also have YouTube memberships and Ko-fi for financial donations. Lastly, if you want to get early, ad-free access to these videos, consider joining the Patreon as well. All of those links are in the description. Now let's talk about one of the ships which has come to represent the transitional period in UEE naval doctrine. To start, let me correct some confusion in the last video, as it ties into here. I said that the Javelin Destroyer is an indicator that the UEE was willing to produce smaller spacecraft. After the Idris, which ballooned in size from the Corvette to a frigate, we have no indication of smaller capital ships designs being made until the Javelin. In fact, the indefatigable class battleship, also yes, that's how you pronounce that, was likely built sometime after or around the Idris, as well as a mention of a Reaper class, which was likely a cruiser towards the end of the Meser era. So between the Idris and the Javelin, there were really no smaller cap ships being built by the UEE. That's what makes Project Monitor so interesting. During the 28th century, the main focus was on what military analysts believed to be humanity's technologically superior rival, the Xi'an. As such, the doctrine was around light patrol ships to act as an early warning screen, mine layers to stealthily deploy screens of mines around key jump points, and fighter squadrons to screen out any clandestine approaches. These would give the UEE just enough time to scramble their fleets along the border to move to the jump points to either defend the entrance or exit, with these lumbering ships built around overwhelming the technologically superior capital ships of the Xi'an. Because no matter how advanced they were, a dense mass going sufficiently fast enough is almost impossible to counter. They didn't need to move far or fast, they just needed to take punches and deal them right back. The fighter doctrine was much of the same, the mainline fighter of the UEE being the Aegis Gladius, designed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the nimble Aeopoa Quali Kartu, or the Direfly. This was, well, flawed to say the least. However, in the dictatorial UEE, the advantage of huge military ships armed to the teeth and advanced nimble fighters able to put on a dramatic air show was as much a psychological weapon against rebellion as it was a tool on the battlefield. During the 27th century, it became clear the Navy was far too reliant on these single combat elements, those being a single battleship, carrier, or destroyer squadron maintaining the line on the border. This needed to change to help make the Navy more flexible. While the Javelin was partially built with the Vanduul in mind, its main focus was to achieve this more flexible navy, with its modular nature being able to refit and fill multiple roles. For more on that, I did an entire video on the Javelin, which I'll link in the top right. However, it was just the start, and more ships were needed to help lighten the load of these massive capital ship centerpieces. At first, the Navy attempted to fix this issue with an ad hoc design, taking transport ships and converting them to the roles they believed they needed. This included the Gwyn class Collier, which was converted to be a fleet screen designed to intercept fighters and torpedoes before they reached the larger ships. While this worked, it wasn't as efficient as a purpose-built design. So in March of 2765, High Command tasked Aegis with making a dedicated anti-fighter platform that could serve as both a key element of standard fleet screen and a cost-effective patrol ship to supplement the aging Perseus. This began what Aegis called Project Monitor a ground-up development of this new ship starting in November of that same year. The structural development lasted 18 months, followed by three years of construction. This led to six prototypes, labeled as the MGX-1 through 6, of which one was designed by a new 24-year-old junior designer named Jude Harris Arnold. Through rigorous testing, slowly each of these six prototypes were whittled down. 
The MJX-1 was retired early due to quantum drive issues, which required a major conceptual overhaul. The MJX-2 suffered significant issues with her shield generators, and the MJX-4 was lost with all hands during a flight trial, though a review board would officially classify the incident as crew error. MJX-5 and 6 were both converted to full-scale articles and delivered to the Navy, but unfortunately both were assigned to reserve units and did not see action. Arnold's design was likely the MJX-1. After its failure, he became demoralized with his job after a lack of feedback from his supervisors, especially after repeated rejections of new designs following his failed prototype. In his spare time, he began to sketch ideas for ships based on the creations of his favorite designer, Leonard Case, after which he'd become disillusioned with Aegis and go on to found Anvil Aerospace. The last remaining prototype, the MJX-3, was spared and is currently stored in one of Aegis's archive facilities in anticipation of an impending restoration for a museum. These failures aside, the result of the prototype program was a highly successful new spacecraft design. Aegis had built a fast warship, nimble enough to properly support a battle group while remaining inexpensive enough to be constructed in large numbers. The ship was officially adopted in 2773 and was named the Hammerhead after its iconic silhouette. The Hammerhead's key components are its turrets. In fact, the ship's nominative silhouette derived from the need to allow maximum possible coverage for anti-fighter weapons, given the ability to fill the field with laser fire during a massed fleet engagement. With a length of 120 meters, a width of 72 meters, and a height of 16 meters, the ship remained rather small, about on par with the venerable RSI Perseus, its companion patrol gunship. However, it required a much larger crew of nine to fully operate, and lacked the amenities of other military ships at the time, being rather spartan in terms of ease of living, but made up for this with its famous toughness. While hammerheads do not all have a consistent naming convention, with each flight having different naming patterns, they all do use whole numbers starting with PCG. It's not clear what PCG stands for, though it likely corresponds to patrol craft gunship, with the first production model ship, the UEES Hammerhead, given the whole number PCG-3748. The UES Hammerhead was transferred to the United Empire of Earth Navy on August 9, 2773, in a commissioning ceremony at MacArthur in the Killian system. After six months of space trials proved uneventful, an additional five holes were approved and allocated to the Fifth Fleet, to serve as proof of concept for newly developed carrier warfare doctrine. These were the UES Dragonet, Garibaldi, Triggerfish, Vindal, and Knifefish. The escort ships were dispatched to form a combat screen for a heavy carrier, and spent the next two years running extensive training exercises aimed at perfecting battle group formations. A variety of bomber units, destroyer, and cruiser squadrons served as aggressors, putting the new ships through simulated combat trials while improving the fleet's overall understanding of spatial warfare tactics. As a result, the Hammerhead became fairly well known among up-and-coming officers assigned to take this work. The general opinion was positive, with officers impressed with both the ship's combat efficiency and overall survivability. These hammerheads were the first of the ship's class to draw blood the next year in 2776, when a Vandal raiding squadron encountered a skirmisher group. Though the firefight was minor, the results were clear. Eight Vandal ships were repulsed without ever entering visual range of the battle group's flagship. Six scythes were shot down, and two forced to escape with the UES Triggerfish scoring an impressive three air-to-air -air kills. The intelligence community remains divided as to whether the Vandal ships were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, or had been shadowing larger naval assets regularly, and were now running afoul with the new navy that was emerging in the late 28th century, with the Hammerhead acting as a foil to these tactics. Later that year, the Triggerfish would go on to destroy an outlaw raider and her escorts, becoming the first ace Hammerhead crew, and proving just how valuable an asset these ships were. As a result, within six months of the Triggerfish's ascension to ace, the Navy doubled their order and sealed a deal of permanent production of this new gunship. Correctly sensing that they had a long-term success on their hands, Aegis heavily invested in factories and infrastructure to expand their Hammerhead lines. By 2779, five factories in three systems were turning out hammerheads, 
with the Navy purchasing them as quickly as possible to outfit a growing number of equipped battle groups made ready for war. As a result, countless variants were produced, customized for a variety of purposes, with the aging Gwyn class entirely supplanted by this new Predator of the Stars. By 2785, the T-shaped design would become permanently associated with fleet defense. The company also greatly expanded their supply chain for the ships, creating a thriving third-party parts market that continues to positively impact hammerhead maintenance today. The first active duty hammerhead loss occurred in 2782, when the UES Garibaldi was ambushed while on reconnaissance by a Vanduul recon and force group. The black box data retrieved from the wreckage indicated that the crew fought valiantly and were able to eliminate several enemy fighter bombers before suffering a crippling torpedo hit to the engine room that flooded the ship with radiation and left it unable to fight on. The surviving crew detonated improvised explosives rather than allow the disabled spacecraft to fall into enemy hands. A second hammered head was lost later that year in an accident. A commercial hauler serving as a combat group suffered a thruster malfunction and collided with the UES Tiburo while undergoing refuel rearm operations. Three were killed aboard the merchant transport, and a board of inquiry ultimately placed the blame on the Tiburo's commanding officer for failing to recognize a supposedly audible proximity alarm. The incident generated long-term distrust from some naval officers, who believed the crew blameless and would lead to the Navy's request for major sensor upgrades, which would lead to the Flight 2 model. The fall of the Messers in 2792 was devastating for Aegis Dynamics. Considered by many to have been the official ships of the Messers, they not only found themselves publicly disgraced, but many called for them to be charged for their role in the fascist regime's war crimes. The new government sought to distance themselves from Aegis's warships in an attempt to rebrand their military, and sought contracts from other manufacturers, like RSI and the new Anvil Aerospace run by the once up-and-coming designer J. Harris Arnold. While this didn't instantly remove the hammerhead from service, it started to become phased out, and all Aegis ships began the process of becoming replaced by newer ships from either RSI or Anvil, leading to the company hemorrhaging money from lost contracts. Luckily for Aegis, the military had not negotiated an exclusive license on the hammerhead design which allowed them to adapt the spacecraft for civilian use in a variety of roles, without governmental oversight in attempt to remain solvent. This would allow Aegis to pivot away from pure government contracts and focus the design of the by-then iconic ship to the needs of their civilian owners. This change would result in the second generation of hammerheads, known as the Flight 2 model in 2817, which replaced the radar emplacement with an additional turret, and redesigned the internal deck layout in response to the readiness reports from gun crews operating in the field. The first wave of Flight 2s was found to have a blind spot, which was corrected with the Flight 2A model. Flight 3 models, which focused on an overall upgrade to modern command and control surfaces, replaced all extant earlier ships by 2915. Since 2930, the Navy slowly began to reintegrate the Hammerhead into service. Aegis's recent resurgence in popularity has allowed them to revisit the classic hull design and repurpose it for the modern age, leading to the Flight 4s. This added multiple additional remote turrets and tools for increased modularity. Today, no battle group leaves port without at least one hammerhead included, and they are frequently assigned to station keeping and long-range patrol duties. This has resulted in a new formation beginning to be utilized by the UE Navy. The new Polaris and the resurgent Hammerheads have become the backbone of system defense. The two ships balance their strength against one another's weaknesses to form a fire team capable of both strong offense, with the Polaris able to deliver devastating salvos from afar, and proper defense from the Hammerheads withering anti-fighter and torpedo screens. This allows for a relatively small force to be able to project control over large systems, as even the largest and most capable of outlaw and pirate forces have been seen to field, at the largest, frigate-class vessels, which this dynamic duo is easily able to counter. The Hammerheads have an extensive history, with many notable engagements and ships throughout its almost two centuries of service. The most significant engagement, exclusively involving Hammerheads, was fought in 2945, as a, quote, full box of 16 Hammerheads flying under a broad pennant encountered a small Vanduul clan setting upon a squadron of whole ships. 
the ensuing battle defied tactical norms, with the group's admiral expertly keeping the ships in formation to train firepower upon the enemy destroyers. Three ships were lost and a fourth damaged beyond repair, but the group managed to rescue the endangered convoy and even destroy a far more powerful alien capital ship. The UES Torsk PCG-3950, the last of the original Hammerheads constructed, saw significant action during the, quote, two-week war, an anti-piracy operation in 2781, aimed at eliminating a number of known outlaw hideouts. This was intended as a show of force to easily establish the Empire's dominance. The Torsk, which single-handedly captured a transport laden with slaves, became the sole highlight of the mission. The UES Paul C. Gerwald PCG-4101 was a famous ghost ship. The Gerwald was separated from her unit and supply chain in 2818 during a long-range reconnaissance in what was then believed to be a Vandal-occupied space. Suffering extensive damage to her navigation system and total jump drive, the crew of the Gerwald spent 18 months disconnected from the fleet before a passing explorer managed to scope their short-range beacon. The Gerwald story was adapted into a propaganda vid, The Iron Will, though historians quickly noted the ship itself was played by a surplus Gwyn-class patrol ship. The UES Elizabeth Collier PCG-4170 was a hammerhead assigned as a screen to Desron-33. Shortly into the Siege of Tiber, a surprise force of Vanduul bombers attacked the squadron's flagship, the Veldor, and scored a crippling blow to her magazine. The Collier's captain, Commander Tyson Granding, took the ship's controls himself, maneuvering the patrol ship into enemy fire to save the crippled destroyer. The hammerhead prevented the destruction of the Veldor, but suffered a direct hit in the process, and was lost with all hands. Granding was given a posthumous promotion to captain. The UES Cheyenne Mountain, PCG-4550, was revealed due to recent declassified documents. It was a post-build testbed for military sensor technologies to use for surveillance missions on the populace. Painted stealth gray and stripped of all weaponry, this hammerhead was believed to be capable of tracking inner system enemy fleet movements while hidden safely within the Oort cloud of a given star system. A lack of stealth broadcasting technology prevented the experiment from being a success, as the ship needed to return to safe space before reporting intelligence. Most active operations, including the Cheyenne Mountain, remain classified. The UES Xanth Montes PCG-4742 was a very long-serving hammerhead assigned to the UEE 3rd Fleet. During her 40-year service, the XM earned more individual battle stars than any other hammerhead in history, in addition to 27 other citations. At the time of her retirement, her commanding officer, Commander Alex Train, had begun his career as a gunner during the XM's very first assignment. The ship's painted mission board currently resides in the Imperial Aerospace Museum. The UES Caberbald PCG-4815 is one of the few remaining Flight 3 hammerheads still in service. The Caberbald is part of the United Empire of Earth's Ready Reserve, moored off of MacArthur. While her engines are kept unpowered, she has a reserve crew available who can bring her and the rest of her squadron to full readiness in 12 hours in the event of a major conflict. Caberbald was last activated during the infamous Jenk Gallen incident in 2943 that briefly threatened to lead a more involved conflict with the Xi'an over the capture of the supposed spy. To learn more about this, look at my video in the top right. The UES Nephili, PCG-5555, nicknamed 45 by her crews, is an active Flight 4 hammerhead currently detailed to the UEE Pathfinders for protection and scouting duties. Nephili is painted in the Pathfinder's livery and holds the informal record for farthest hammerhead from home after a series of long-range jumps that took her exploratory squadron well beyond the boundaries of known space. Nephili is a combat veteran with over 80 confirmed Vanduul kills and dozens of successful combat operations. The UES Enyo PCG-6109 is an active duty hammerhead currently attached to the Home Squadron, moored at Earth, where it has been used to ferry diplomats to fleet functions and naval reviews. Enyo has reinforced shielding and additional armor, and a reworked interior custom designed to support such visitors. 
To date, she has borne the temporary title of Imperator I four times. Externally, the Enyo appears identical to any other service hammerhead. On the civil side, bonded hammerheads are becoming an increasingly common sight, with many civilians using them as armored transports or outfit them for a variety of other purposes, ranging from low-level blockade ships to highly customized medical ships. However, most of these upgrades are one-off and done after market, as Aegis itself has stopped customizing hammerhead layouts for non-military customers. Perhaps the most infamous civilian hammerhead is the Twilight Assessor, a Navy surplus Flight 2A ship which was converted into a high-risk observation platform for tourists. I did a full breakdown on the ship in the video on Weird and Interesting Ships of the Verse which talks about the mystery that this ship became embroiled in. Check it out in the top right to learn more. Overall, the Hammerhead is a fascinating ship, with an extensive history as both a combat and civilian ship. It has proved to be an adaptable platform and terrifying opponent on the battlefield. With the future Flight 5s being tested, it's clear that the Hammerhead is not going away anytime soon, and is set to remain a staple of UEE ships for generations to come. I'd like to thank you for watching, and I'd like to thank those on screen now for supporting the channel financially. If you want to throw in a few credits, think about becoming a member on YouTube, and if you want a bit more for your contribution, join the Patreon. Patreons get early, ad-free access to all videos, including exclusive early access to my long-running Complete History of Star Citizen lore series, whose three episodes are available for public now. If you want to know just what you're getting, check the playlist of all the episodes in the top right. Now, I want to hear your thoughts on the Hammerhead and any other lore topics in the comments below. And as always, remember, Ex Historia Ad Astra.